you got your Bibles, let's go to the book of John, chapter number four. And I'm going to begin reading verses 19 through 24. I'm going to read out of the ESV, John chapter 4, verses 19 through 24. Uh, this is an amen church. This is a preach pastor church. This is a you, whatever y'all say. I don't know what y'all say, but uh, this is a holla at your boy church. And uh, so we're going to preach this. Y'all ready to preach? Y'all ready to get into this word? Before I open up my mouth, look at your neighbor, say neighbor. You see, I'm doing my preacher voice, say neighbor. Put on your shoes, because he steps on toes. John chapter 4, verse 19 to 24 says, The woman said to him, we are in the middle of a conversation. I'm picking it up in the middle of a conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And uh, as he's talking to this woman at a well, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers. Everybody say true worshipers. Come on, everybody say true worshipers. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The title of my message today is Two Truths and a Lie. Two truths and a lie. Father, I pray that we will receive a word that would change and transform our lives forevermore. Hide me behind your cross. Let your voice be louder than mine. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say. Everybody say. Two truths and a lie. Anybody in this room ever played the game Two Truths and a Lie? Can I see your hands? Can I see your Anybody you've never heard of this before? Raise your hand if you've never heard of Two Truths and a Lie. Okay, I got you. Pops, I got you. No, I'm playing. I got you, sir. And uh, two truth and a lie is an icebreaker game to play with people who are trying to get to know each other better. The main instruction of the game are that each member of the group introduces themselves by stating two truths and one lie about themselves. The statements don't have to be intimate, life-revealing things. They can simply be hobbies, interests, or past experiences that make each person unique. The lie can be outrageous and wacky or sound like the truth, making it harder for other participants. One at a time, a person share their statements. The group guesses which statements are true and which ones are a lie. We are about to play this game together right now. I have written three statements about myself. And you have to figure out which statements are true and which statements are a lie. Do y'all got it? DJ, play that track. Okay. I don't know if y'all can see it because my podium's here. Uh, I have never had Chick-fil-A sauce. I once stole a bottle of cologne from Macy's. I once sang with the boy band New Kids on the Block for a charity event. Which one is the lie? 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 How many people think number one is a lie? Okay. How many people think number two is a lie? How many people think number three is a lie? Wow, nobody thinks so. Y'all just, you know. <laughs> number one is the truth. Number three is the truth. Yeah. Number two is a straight up lie. You thief. <laughs> I've never had Polynesian, Polynesian, whatever y'all call it. 
I've never, hear me, the chicken is good all by itself. If you need, you don't need to add no sauce to it. It's already good. That's like you adding something to Jesus. That's why you're adding your little sage to Jesus, because you added, that's why you're doing that. Because you keep adding the stuff that's already good. Isn't it interesting how difficult it can be to tell the difference between a truth and a lie? Ain't it crazy how you could be looking at something, I mean, your two eyes are staring at it, and it's hard to figure out, is this true or is this a lie? This is why as believers, we have to have something called discernment. What is discernment? It's that Holy Spirit. It's that, it's that nowhere in you that can look at something that seems to be truthful, but your discernment is saying that's a lie. Because your natural eye can't always tell the difference. Can I get an amen? Your natural eye can't always tell what's the truth and what's a lie. You can be looking at a house and everything about the house look good. Inspection went good. Real estate agent said it's good. Everybody said it's good. But that knower in you say, run for your life. Asbestos. <laughs> Lead. Mold, and you're like, no, there's no, no, but something in you said, I, 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 you can be looking at a business deal. Anybody ever sat at a business deal? Everything lined up, everything looked good, and right before you was about to sign the deal, Holy Spirit said, uh uh, that's not it. Ever going for a job, and you went to that job, and you said, ooh, you told everybody, I got the job, this is the one, and then Holy Spirit said, something ain't right. And you ever had to say no to something? And you're like, but ooh, what is it? Your discerner. Come on, ladies, ever saw a man that looked good on paper? I mean, good on paper. But Holy Spirit said, ah, 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 crazy, demon. No, he's in demand. No, he's a demon. <laughs> what happened? What happened was, it's hard to figure out if you're not careful in life. You got to figure out the difference between what's true and what's not. That brings me to John 4. John 4, Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman. And during the conversation with the Samaritan woman, a conversation about worship comes up. Now, come on now. He's talking to Samaritan woman. Jewish rabbis did not talk to women alone. Uh, 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 Jesus uh, is sitting here as a Jew talking to a Samaritan. They don't talk. We know Jesus went out of his way to get to this well at this time to meet with this specific woman because he got Samaria on his mind. And while they're talking, she brings up the topic of worship. Now, scholars suggest that she's deflecting because we do that when we try to hide our sin and what's really going on in our lives. And she hits on this topic of worship. But before Jesus gets back to her life, he pauses here for a second. And say, so you want to talk about worship? Let's talk. And in talking about worship, Jesus uses a phrase that is interesting. If you look at verse 23, Jesus says the words, he says the time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers, uh-oh, uh-oh, when the true Worship. Why Jesus have to add that adjective to worshipers? He could have so easily just said, hey, time is coming and now is when the worshipers are going to worship and spread the truth. No, no, no. Jesus makes it clear that there's something called true worshipers. If true worshipers is a thing, then the reverse is true as well. There's something called a fake worshiper. And the problem is that Jesus has to distinguish the difference between true worshipers and fake worshipers. Because you cannot always tell just looking from your eye who's really a true worshiper and who's one of them fake worshipers. And the problem is that true worshipers and fake worshipers sound the same. 
We both say hallelujah. We, we both say God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. We both got our hands up. We, we both be in church. And if you're not careful, you can be looking around and saying, hey, I can't tell the difference. You can be thinking everybody is the same, that all worshipers are the same. This is one of the challenges. You know my story. I ain't got no shame in my game. Uh, I grew up in church. I'm not new to this. I'm true to this. I was born in church, been pretty much in church my whole life. There are pros and cons with that. Obviously, some of the pros is that you learn some morals that maybe your friends didn't learn or, or you don't, I don't, I'm not all, I don't got all kind of story of all kind of craziness that I had to go through. The reality of it is majority of my life, I kind of did the right thing and God was with me and all that. But one of the cons is that you can be church so much that you know how to play the game. You, you know when to stand up. When to sit down. You know when to say amen. You know when to run. You know when to holler. You know when to ah, you know, you know when the song gets good. You know how to, you know how to shout. You know how to do all the. And it is possible that you have been churched for so long that you do this from ritual and not from relationship. It's possible that you do this from a tradition. And not from transformation. Let me pause right there. I'm coming right back to that. Y'all see that right there? Parking right there. Let me, I'm going to go over here real quick. I'm coming right back to that. Planet Fitness. <laughs> Planet Fitness have something called gym intimidation. What is gym intimidation? Gym intimidation is Planet Fitness are asking all you buff people, don't come in here. <laughs> Why do they do that? Because of gym intimidation. What is gym intimidation? Gym intimidation is I got a regular body. I'm trying to work out, but I'm getting discouraged and intimidated because I'm looking at all you gold gym people who don't want to pay the price over there because you want $9.99 and a suntan room. And so you come over here, and now I'm getting discouraged hearing you growl and grunt every time you lift and I'm just here with my basic weights and so they said hey don't come up in here because we don't want to discourage people all right I told you I was coming back to that same thing happens in church you there's there's worship intimidation when you be seeing people you be in church and you say man I can't sing like that and I don't shout like them and my hands don't go up that fast and look at them crying and you might be thinking everything you see is a true worshiper but you can be dancing and far away from God you 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 can be hollering far away from God I know you want to see people running up here but everybody who running up at the stage don't mean you a true worshiper just because you know how to work it in here don't make you no true worshiper. Because the only thing that distinguishes a true worshiper from a fake worshiper is the posture of one's heart. Because worship is not an external thing. Worship is an internal thing. Worship is something happened in your heart. And you can play the pastor, but you can't play God. This is why 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 17 says, The Lord said to Samuel, come on, when Jesse's sons was all coming in here, and he had to anoint one of the sons to be the next king, the Lord said, uh-uh, don't be fooled by appearance or height. I've rejected everybody you're looking at. Mm, the Lord has rejected some of the people that you're impressed with. The Lord said, yeah, you like them, but that ain't, that ain't got nothing to do with me. God says, the Lord don't look at the things people look at. Look at that shot. Look at that shot. No, 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 no. Be careful. I'm not trying to make you skeptical. I'm trying to get you to take your eyes off of things that we call worship. And say, that does not mean that's what worship is. Now, come on now. I dance with the best of them. That does not mean that's what worship is. Because God said, I'm not looking at the outward appearance. What I'm looking at is a heart. Worship is heart. What does your heart look like? What 
is the posture of your heart. And what I am trying to do is get us to become people who have a heart posture towards God. Because if you can get your heart posture right, you can get God's attention. And if we get God's attention, we can't be moved. If we get God's attention, he will fill this room. If we get God's attention, you will see miracles. If we can get our heart posture in a place, see, you're trying to look the part, I'm trying to make you the part. If we can all come in here with our hearts in the right place, sickness has to come off your body. Addictions have to be burnt up. Generational curses have to be broken. Chains of depression and anxiety has got to get off your life. Stuff that you've been trying years to break free from will come off in a matter of seconds. If we can get hundreds of people to walk into this room with the right heart posture before God, God begins to send his glory. And if his glory falls, everything in your life changes. There are some stuff, see you want me to lay hands, but if you really get your heart posture right, Holy Ghost will lay hands on you right there in your seat. You will leave free. You will leave with the captives being free. You will leave with prison doors opening. I promise you, you get this worship thing right, God starts doing supernatural surgery. You get this heart posture right where you become a true worshiper. Yeah. Your mind starts getting different. Your body starts getting different. You start feeling lighter about your life because worship is a spirit. That's why he said spirit and truth. You've heard me say it a hundred times. You cannot fight a natural battle. I'm sorry. You cannot fight a spiritual battle with natural weapons. Worship is a spirit thing. And some of the stuff holding you up is spiritual. Some of the stuff that's stopping you is spiritual. Some of the stuff that's blocking you is spiritual. Some of the stuff that's in your way is spiritual. And if you get this worship thing down where your heart posture gets right before God, all of a sudden things start to change. So let me give you three truths about worship. Write this down. Uh, put on your shoes because I plan on stepping on somebody's toes. I like you and I hope you like me too and I hope we can like each other uh, after this. Three truths you want to know about worship. Number one, worship isn't about location. That's a lie. It's about desperation. That's true. The lie is worship is about a location. It's not about location. Worship is about desperation. Come on, everybody say not location, not location. but desperation. In this passage, the woman starts talking about worship and the first thing she goes to is the location. She starts talking about something called sacred sites. She says, Samaritans worship at the Mount of Gerizim. But you Jews, you worship in the temple of Jerusalem. And Jews and Samaritans are fighting about the right location of where we worship. Because a Jew didn't consider it worship unless it was in Jerusalem, unless it was near the temple. Samaritans said, no, this mountain is where Moses was on. This is where we worship. So they're fighting back and forth. Jesus says, I don't care about no location. Jesus says, worship me in spirit and in truth. He said, forget the mountain. Forget Jerusalem. God don't care about that. Location is not the issue. The issue is, does your heart, do you have a heart? That is desperate for God. It's so quiet in here. I'm going to tell you why it's quiet. Because y'all are looking at me and saying, you know what, Pastor? That's right. How dare them Jews make worship about a location? How dare them Samaritans do that? How dare they relegate worship to a location? But you do the same thing. Because there's this idea I can only worship God in a church building. Let me be your pastor for a second. We say stuff like, I, I can't worship because they put me in overflow. I'm going to worship. When I'm in the room. I've been drinking. 
I can't be in the room. How can I worship? I can't worship because this is not the seat I like. I like to sit on the end, and they put me in the middle of the day, so I can't really worship. I, I'm used to sitting over there and I'm in front of the speaker and, and can't worship. I can't, I, I can't really worship because there's not a live preacher here. And, I, and if there's a screen, then I can't lift my hands. I'm sorry. It's got to be a human in front of me. It's a high school, and a pastor, when well, you guys get a permanent building, then I'll come in. I just can't go to high school. It just doesn't feel like church to me. Pastor, y'all changed the time I'm used to 10. You moved here. I felt God at 11, and now you didn't move. It Maybe you rely on a location more than you think. When you become a true worshiper, location don't matter to you. Fake worshipers rely on a location to get their heart in a position to worship God. But when you are a true worshiper, you can worship in a car. You can worship in an overflow. You can worship in a hospital. You can worship in a high school. Don't make no difference where I'm at because it's not about where I worship. It's about who I worship and why I worship. And I'm sorry if a location can break your worship it was fake from the beginning if location can move you from lifting your hands and giving God your heart were you a true worshiper or were you one of them church goers who was a fake worshiper but you didn't really have your heart with God because fake worshipers rely on convenience Fake worshipers needed to be comfortable, they needed to be convenient, they needed to be nice, whereas a true worshipers aren't looking for convenience. True worship don't need comfortability. Read your Bible. In Hebrews, there is a phrase that calls it the sacrifice of praise. Praise as a sacrifice of Sacrifice means pain. Sacrifice means something die. Sacrifice means something hurt. Real worship is pain. It is tears in my eyes, but my hands lifted up. It is my heart just got broke, but I'll still bless the Lord. It is though he slay me, yet will I trust him. When you are a true worshiper, this, this hurts. Don't, it's not relying on no AC. It's not relying on lights. Now, we are not foolish. We do our best to create as many distractions. We try to eliminate as many distractions as possible. But babies still cry. Fog machines still break. Seats still don't be comfortable. It still get tight in here. Is that going to break your worship? No, this is, God don't care about no location. Here's what God cares about. Psalm chapter 51, verse 17. The sacrifice that God desires is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart. What God is looking for is a desperation. It is a, yep, life is not good right now, but I need you. Things are not the way I want it to be, but I will magnify the Lord. I will bless his name. I will exalt him. It is a heart that says, God, I need you. There is this war going on right now about first dates. And where do you bring someone on a first date? And there's this idea that if a man doesn't take a woman to a steakhouse on date one, 
then somehow she's devalued. And so there's all these reels of women who are saying, you know, don't take me for no ice cream. Don't take me for no coffee. And I'm not going for no walk. I'm not going to the park. And then you got all these men saying, well, I'm not paying the bill by myself. You're going to split this. It's going to let you bought this. I bought that. When me and my wife, our first date was at a pizza shop. I may have spent $15 on that pizza. We split a pizza, cut it in half, and had the time of our lives. Because when it's the real thing, the location, it don't matter. Yeah, we live in a nice house now, but we started in a one bedroom, one bathroom. Take the house. You cannot take the love that we have because didn't no house build this love. Didn't no steakhouse build this love. This thing ain't determined by location. This thing is determined by a desperation for one another. And God is saying, can you worship me if I take everything from you? Can you still open up your mouth? Can you or was it just because you were blessed? But can you not be blessed and still say, God, I will praise you from a prison. Because when you're really desperate for God, location don't matter. I don't care because it's not about these conditions. Number two, write this down. Worship isn't a song, it's a surrender. True worshipers are about surrender. You fake worshipers are about them songs. Sometimes we rely on the song to get us to worship. But the songs are supposed to be an expression of a life that is surrendered to God. And now we're living in a day where we're fighting over what's a real worship song, what's not a worship song, what does the lyrics say, what does the kick. God don't care about lyrics, he cares about life. And you're trying to give God lyrics. What God really wants is your life. Here's what worship sounds like. Worship sounds like God being able to tell you what to do. See, you like God as friend. You don't like God as Lord. You like friend of God. He calls me friend. But what about that Lord part? What God wants is to be able to say, I'm giving you your plans. I'm giving you your dreams. I'm giving you your timeline. You know what worship is? Worship is God, here's my timeline. I'm surrendering it to you. Do it when you want. You know what worship sounds like? (laughs) Worship Sounds like, God, can I date her? And God says, no. And you say, okay, I surrender. I surrender. See, you think people are crying in worship because of a melody. But they're crying in worship because I had to kill something to praise God like this. You don't know what I had to put a knife in. It's not, a, it's not the keys. It's not the harmony. It's I had to kill an Isaac in my life. And I'm crying because it's breaking me. I had to surrender something to his will. When you get there, tears will come down your face and people will think it was a nice singer. They're foolish. It was not a singer that moved me. It was I had a plan for my life and God told me to switch it up. 
and I had to pull out a knife and I had to cut my own plan. And so now when I get in worship, he got me surrendered. Because where am I going now? Where am I going? See, that's why you keep running to the club and to that, to that. Where am I going? I done gave it up. So he got me. So because this is all I got, let me worship. Let me praise him. Because you don't know what I had to give up. You don't know what I had to say no to. God, I'm going on a girl's trip. I don't like them girls. <laughs> but what? 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 God, they were there for me when I had nothing. But she was with me. When... I don't like them girls. But we already put a down pay deposit. I don't. Like them girls. And worship is you having to pick up the phone and say, hey, y'all can't do this one. Girl, what's your problem? What's wrong with you? Uh, that short preacher in your business? <laughs> I knew Union was going to do that to you. I knew Union was going to switch you up. And you got to hang up the phone feeling foolish and lonely and empty and vulnerable and then that's when angels show up then that's when God comes in the room then that's when Holy Spirit surrounds you then that's when you get that new strength and that is where you find worship hear me if God don't have your surrender you can keep your songs because you don't sing that good you don't sing good enough for God to ignore that you won't give up anything for him. You're not that good. God is not so impressed with your range and your runs that you cannot make any sacrifice and he just loved to hear you the way you sing. No, he gave a gift without repentance. I can't take a gift back that I gave. Yeah, that's a gift. It's cool. I gave it to you on purpose. But it's not doing nothing. It's not doing nothing. I don't care how many record labels sign you. It's not doing nothing. I don't care how many awards you win. It's not doing nothing because there's no sacrifice behind it. There's no surrender in it. Matthew 15, 8 verses 9. Jesus says, these people, you honor me with your lips, but your heart far from me. They worship me in vain. They worship me for themselves. They worship me to be seen by people. They worship me to go viral and be on clips. They worship me because they want to impress people that rejected them from their path. That ain't for me. You worshiping for haters who mad at you, so now let them see you worship now. Stop it. Well, you know, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But by the time you get to the table, you have died so much. You ain't got time to worry about your haters. You got too many wounds and scars from... You know what it takes to get to that table? There are some people that I call professional daters. Love dating. <laughs> and you will meet a person. You will date a person. You will sleep with a person. You will move in with a person. You will have kids with this person. But the moment the word marriage comes up, you get an allergic reaction. But you sleep with them. You live with them. You've got kids with them. But marriage. <laughs> gotta talk, gotta talk, gotta talk. Because you like the feeling 
but you don't like the cost that comes with commitment. Because commitment costs you something. Because as long as we're not married, I really don't have to give up much. But the moment we get married, I got to kill stuff and sacrifice stuff because commitment will cost you something. And most people, you like the feeling of Jesus. You like the feeling of worship. So, so you, that's why you have secular radio stations who play booty all week, killing all week, shoot them up all week. And now we're not just kill, 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 kill. And then on Sunday, play an hour of worship. <laughs> hey, y'all, y'all know what time it is. Come on, it's jamming 95.8. We know what we do is Sunday morning. Kirk Franklin. <laughs> and you sitting in the house, high, drunk, my life is in. With Jesus, I can make it. Because you like that feeling. You like the way the music make you feel. But the moment there's a cost that comes with a commitment, you get an allergic reaction and you run for your life because you like the feeling of this, but you don't want the commitment that comes with this. And here's my fear. My fear is that you're going to delay this commitment for so long that the enemy's going to snatch you up and the enemy's going to mess you up. And while you have been playing with God, the enemy has been setting up a trap for you. The enemy has been putting stuff in your way. The enemy will hunt you down. The enemy don't just come out loud and attack you. No, he positions things in place. The enemy will wait years. The enemy will spend 20 years studying you and setting stuff up just for one bad night, one bad morning, one bad day, and he got you. Got you so hooked on something you can't even break it off your life. Got you so messed up in something that you can't even recover from. And my here is that your cost, this you running from the cost of commitment. Because hear me, you're going you're gonna to sacrifice something at some point. You're either going to sacrifice some pleasure for God, or you're going to sacrifice your purpose to the devil. But you're going to sacrifice. And some of you have sacrificed your kids. Sacrificed your destiny. Sacrificed your health to the devil. Because you don't want to give up some pleasure and sacrifice it to God. Because worship is not about a song. Worship is about a surrender. Push your neighbor and say, is he talking to you? Because please, I hope he's not talking to me. I'm praying that he's not talking about me. He really got me thinking twice. Josh, you guys can come play. Here's my last point. Worship isn't about your feelings. It's about your faith. Worship isn't about your feelings. It's about your faith. Feelings are to be led, not followed. Feelings are a great slave, horrible master. Because feelings are fickle. Come on, do you always feel like going to work? Do you always feel like taking out the trash? Do you always feel like working out? Come on now, do you always feel like cutting the lawn? You don't always feel like getting gas. Some of you pray, that's on your prayer list. I wish I had somebody who can get gas for me. That's all I want. That's all I want.
You don't always feel like waking up at 5 a.m. But you're not a child. And because you're not a child, you don't consult your feelings, you command your feelings. Well, pastor, I can't worship because I just don't feel like it. We didn't ask you how you felt. You think we're worshiping because we feel like it? You think we always come in here wanting to sing these songs, wanting to lift our hands? No. Are you kidding me? I'm about as tired as you are. I got as many problems as you have. But I'm not consulting my feelings about what God deserves. Because my feelings don't get a say in this. I didn't ask my feelings about what you think about God. I don't worship him because I feel like it. I worship him because my faith said, had he not woke me up this morning, I don't know where I'd be. I worship him because my faith says that he brought me from a mighty long way. I worship him because my faith says that he's been better to me than I've ever been to myself. I worship him because my faith says he's going to open the door. My faith says he's the great I am. My faith says he's the beginning and the end. My faith says that you are to this worship. So so that's why I love what David said in Psalm chapter 34 verse 1 I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be in my mouth you know what that means it means you walk up in here and say hands you better lift up to God feet you better get yourself together mouth you better open up I don't care how I feel I'm not consulting my feelings my faith says he's worthy of praise my faith says he's worthy of the glory. I don't feel like dancing. I ain't dancing for my feeling. I'm dancing because my faith says that he's about to do something that eyes haven't seen, it. ears haven't heard. I, I'm praising God because my faith says that he's an on-time God. My, my faith says he can destroy a lion. My, my faith says Goliaths are getting out of my way. I'm not worshiping him. Come on, you got to learn how to worship without a feeling. You got to learn how to worship without motivation. You got to learn how to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. But we will bless the Lord. It's five in the morning, but I'll bless the Lord. Come on, I just got bad news, but I'm going to bless the Lord. Because I ain't doing this from no feeling. My faith says that he's God. And that he's worthy of glory. And that he's worthy of honor that's why Jesus said they that worship me must worship in spirit and in truth so I'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made. And when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Can you take 30 seconds with no motivation and no feeling? Can you just worship God right where you are with nobody pumping you up? Can you just take 30 seconds? to say, God, I don't need anybody to hype me up or get me together. I just want to say thank you. I just want to worship you. I, I just want to bless the name of the Lord. I, I just want to surrender some worship. I, this is called the sacrifice of praise. This is a praise that don't come from no hype. This is a praise that comes from an understanding that he is my Lord, that he is my God, that he is my way maker, that he is my rock that he is my shelter in the times of storm, that he is the God that is the way and the truth and the life and that no one
one gets to God lest you go through the sun. This is the moment where I give praises, not because of how I feel, but because of my faith says you're worthy of praise. That's why the songwriter said it's your breath in my lungs, so I pour out my praise. If you have his breath, then you should give him praise. If you got his breath in your lungs, you should open your mouth. If you have his breath, how dare you have the breath of God in your lungs and not give God praise from that same breath that he put into your body. Can somebody in the room open up your mouth and say, God, I worship you. God, on my best day, I'm going to worship. On my worst day, I'm going to worship because you're worthy of all the honor and you're worthy of all the praise. God, I'd be dead without you. I, I'd be in a prison without you. I, my mind would be lost without you. But, but God, had it not been for you on my side, God, I will give you the praise. And God, I'll give you the honor. You're worthy of my hand claps. And you're worthy of my shouting. And you're, you're worthy of my dancing. And you're worthy of my song. And you're worthy of my tears. God, I praise you. God, I bless you. God, I lift you up. I will magnify the Lord. If nobody else will praise you, if nobody else will praise you, I'll praise you by myself. God, I'll praise you by myself. If I'm the last man standing, God, I'm going to bless the name of the Lord. God, I'm going to praise you because you never left me. You never left me. You never left me. My whole life you've been keeping me. My whole life you've been keeping me. And God, I will magnify your name. God, I'm going to bless your name. I don't care how I feel. I don't care what's going on in my day. God, you're worthy of my show. You're worthy of the praise. You're worthy of the glory. You're worthy of the honor. God, we worship you in spirit and we worship you in truth. We worship in spirit. We worship in truth. And we magnify your name. pray for every person under the sound of my voice. I pray this week they experience a true divine encounter. I pray, Lord, that all of our worship will be preceded 
by a life of surrender. I pray that any person in this room who's having difficulty sacrificing something for you, I pray today they would receive a strength that would allow them to make a sacrifice of praise to your name. If you're in this room, I know people are standing and hands are in the air and tears are coming down people's face. If you want to give your life to Jesus right now, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. and This prayer is going to declare for you that today is going to mark today as your birthday, your spiritual birthday. The greatest thing you can surrender today is a life to God. And as you surrender your life to God, watch what he's going to do in your life. Can everybody say this prayer together? Say, Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to sacrifice for me. So now I sacrifice my life for you. I believe Jesus is Lord, and today I make you the Lord and the ruler of my life. Save me now. I belong to you. In Jesus' name, let everybody say.